guys so very much for coming as well. Uh, hope we're going to keep you informed and, and awake for the next, how much, hour? That's how, how much we got, right? Okay, he said I got an hour to talk, so, oh my gosh, I'm excited. You, you know, I like, I like starting presentations with a little bit of trivia. And uh, the oil and gas industry is a really important industry for, for the world. Does anybody know any, anything about, well, we've all heard about the oil sands, right? Who hasn't? Everybody's heard about the oil sands. Does anybody know how much oil is in there, the reserves? Three trillion barrels of oil has been uh, identified. It's not all proven, but that's the, the reserve amount. How about the Middle East? Does anybody know how much reserve exists in the Middle East? Proven reserve in the Middle East is about 840 billion barrels. That's already proven. Uh, what about the daily usage? Does anybody know how much oil we use on a daily, daily basis? Wild gas. 20 million? 84. You're right. Very, very close. And in the U.S., does anybody know how much oil we use in the U.S. on a daily basis? 24 million barrels. A huge consumer of, of oil. I guess it's because of all those big cars and stuff that those guys drive across there. In, in 2009, actually, it worked on to, to roughly 1,000 barrels per second. And there's a really awesome book that is written on, on the history of energy, where we move from coal to, to uh, oil, and then, sorry, we move from whale oil to coal, then to, to uh, petroleum, and the next stage, we're not sure what it's going to be. Renewables, probably, combination, I don't know. But it's a very interesting in industry, and with it being a, a, a non-renewable uh, source of energy, we had to find means of really managing that uh, resource as effectively as is possible. So I, what I'm going to try to do is be on time. I think I got about 15 minutes to talk. So, so I'm going to try to, to just touch on, on a high level approach to operational excellence and, and see if I can get you guys buying on the concept. There's some strong benefits from OEMS, and, and really, at the end of the day, uh, everything is, is translated from a business perspective into dollars and cents. If we can make money, there's no point in us being in business. And this is Exxon. Exxon actually introduced OEMS back in the 1980s. And if you look at the picture as a result of that, when you look at, when you focus on the net income and the return on capital employed, you see an amazingly beautiful graph that is trending up. And as prices go up, their margins and their benefits really climb. The dip that you see in 2009 was a result of the, the market collapse that took place then. But the resilience of the organization because of the uh, the fact that they had disciplined processes in place was very strong, so they were able to rebound really, really quickly. And if you look at the, the lines at the bottom, the two very lines at the bottom, because they had had operational excellence embedded in the organization as a part of the culture for a very long time, since the 1980s they embarked on this journey in the 20, in, two, in early 2000s, this thing was part of the way we live. This is how we do business in, in Exxon you saw that the HSC performance was amazingly low and consistent. The next company that went on that journey was Exxon, sorry, Chevron. And they started off that journey, late, uh, sorry, they started thinking about it, conceptualizing it in the 1990s and really got serious and kicked it off in the early 2000s. And again, what you saw is the dotted lines actually show a nice smooth flow down from an HSC perspective and the trend, the, the, the ticker line, the red and the blue for earnings and net income really went up slowly but they were climbing, they were doing it, I mean it was beginning to become part of the culture of the organization. 
2009, you see a similar dip, just like you saw in Exxon. But the recovery was very strong again. This is Suncor, who started the journey in 2011. Prior to that, you can see the erratic behavior of the performance. They were up and down, right? HSC performance, trending in the right direction, but not as stable. And then we had BP. BP, which was supposed to be one of those organizations. Which, you know, they were all doing, we, we've all had management system. The level of discipline guides whether or not you can become excellent in the process. They were trending down, they were doing a good job, but they were not as defined and productive and consistent as Exxon and Chevron in terms of the trend, overall trend in the net earnings and, and uh, return on capital employed. And in 2010, what we all know what happened in 2010, uh, th that was a Macondo incident where we killed 11 or 12 people and we created a, a monster mess in, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. But once you put operational excellence in the organization and you believe in it, has the potential to do amazing things for the company, for the organization. And that's why I, I think, you know, we've, we've gotten peer, we've, we've beaten, or not beaten, I shouldn't say beat, beaten, we've introduced HSE management systems in the organization. We've buffered that up with PSM. And now the next level is what, what is called management systems, so operationally excellent management systems. I think many organizations are gonna be moving in that direction and trying to get it right because the long-term benefits of it is really, really strong for organizations. When we think about it, we have HEC management systems, PSM, OEMS, and really at the end of the day, it's all about managing people, managing the processes and systems that you have in your organization, and the facilities and technology. Getting those three big buckets right help you to deliver on an operationally excellent management system. And really, when you think about it, what the competence of an OEMS is about procedures and training and learning and all those sort of good stuff, plus looking after the pots and pans in your business. That's your vessels, your pipeline, your pumps, your compressors, and all those other things. But the key ingredient is that red, red bubble. They are the operations discipline that is required. We have to do it. Okay, we, we saw in some of our earlier presentation, MOC open task on MOC that Baco had at some point, and then we will hear some more about that from, from speakers. Simon, Simon, when she t tells us a bit more about it, what gets measured gets done, right? When people measure things, and particularly if it's bad, somebody's gonna do something about it, and you're gonna see how that happens. But being disciplined really helps us to generate strong performance. The thing about OEMS and leadership is about creating a vision. Strong visionary leaders have the potential to generate sustainable global performance. Wherever you are in the world, if we have a global organization and we do it right, we have the same practices, the same sort of principles and guidance, same way of doing business, the trend is going to go up. It is going to go up. But you have to create that compelling sense of direction for your workers. We should all share that vision. There's no point in me being a, in that organization and not supporting the vision of the organization. Because if I don't, I'll create mischief, I'll create distraction, I'll do all the things for us to not achieve what we want to achieve. And as a leader in the organization, I have, my leader have to recognize that I am a problem and take corrective steps to deal with it. Because if you don't, then it becomes a real issue for, for you to handle in the long run. So it starts with the vision. You have to involve the people. We talked about involvement and engagement, Professor uh, Dominic actually. Is it Dominic? This one? Yeah, Cooper talked about involvement, engagement, very important. Communicating the vision, we've got to communicate it continuously over and over for people. We've got to share it, make sure that everybody believes in it. If you don't believe in it, you might as well forget it. And over time, we need to keep evolving and make, making sure that the vision adjusts to all of the environmental changes that take place. 
and we got to sustain it in the long run or else it's not going to happen. So the, the way this thing Max speaks, takes place is it has to happen from, from the senior leadership out on this end here who goes out and preaches. Where's the little point there? Oops, sorry guys. Which one is the point? Yeah, this, this guy here, he's the CEO. He's the, he has to preach this thing to everybody in the, in the organization. And he can use all sorts of report and email and whatever. But the most powerful thing is talking to them directly. And the guys in the back who are the, the, the managers and the senior leaders, they got to engage and collaborate and understand what we're trying to achieve and what's the best method to getting that message out there. The thing about, about this vision is you must have alignment. If people are not aligned in the process, if the, if the vision is world domination, well, our values and beliefs must support that. And the leader needs to sell that. And then the senior managers and the executives got to believe in it. And then all the guys on the tool have to say, well, all right, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to conquer the world, and here's how we're going to do it. So when we talk about OEMS, it's made up of a series of elements. And really, it's building on one over the other. It started many years ago with TQM and TLM total quality management, total loss management, then we ended up having personal safety management systems that evolved with uh, some of the major, major process safety incidents, the process safety management, and now we're looking at operationally excellent management system. And really what it does is it says OEMS is essentially, you know, your safety management system on steroids. It's, it's, it's a, a beefed up safety management system because we understand that good safety generates good results. OEMS without discipline, you might as well forget it. But if you apply discipline, operations discipline with OEMS, all those elements, you're going to get excellent performance. So, so the thing about it, in terms of measuring OEMS effectiveness, really what you do is you start with the elements. And under the people element, there's a bunch of elements that you're going to have. And each one of these is a high level set of, of requirements. And believe that is a set of sub elements that are required for you to deliver on the, deliver on the people requirement. And each one of them has to be supported by indicators. Because if you don't measure it, you might as well forget it. Same thing in Batco. If we didn't know we had 300 and something open MOC items, we would have never gotten to the point where it's near zero at this stage. And you need to know where you are. This, this is a maturity model for OEMS. We've seen different versions of this. We've seen uh, down at the bottom here, we talked about it being uh, somebody else. The, what, what was the title of this on, on the slide? Anybody attended the, the Hearts and Minds presentation? Workshop. They had a different term for this, uh, and they had a, another term for this. But these three were pretty much the same uh, title. But essentially what it is, it's moving the organization from reactive and, and chaotic, where you don't have you, you know, an organized process, to where you're basically what is called world class and everybody else wants to follow what you're doing. And most times, organization, this is where you're shooting for all of your practices and standards are designed to get you at regulatory performance or above. This is where we're supposed to be. Most organizations today are sitting in this line here, just between here, partially implemented. The key thing is to identify your gaps. What are the gaps on each one of the elements in the sub-element? Because if you know what the gaps are, using the model above that we just looked at, you can fix it. If you don't know where the problem is, you can't fix it. So finding out the gaps from an element, sub-element, uh, what specifically the gaps are, you can fix it. The way you do that is by having people do what is called a self-assessment. 
the business unit do a self-assessment. Let them analyze where the problem is because they know the problem better than you do. They know the processes better than you do. Here are the requirements. Here's your business. Look at it and see where the gaps are. And then have some objective eyes look over what they come up with because guess what? If I'm looking at it, some of us are so bad about it, we, we will score ourselves really low. Other people say, my gosh, nobody wants to call a baby an ugly baby. So they're going to say, yes, you know, I got it right. Everything is nice and smooth. For some objective group, from an audit perspective, gets the opportunity to review and give you a good objective score. And that helps you to determine where you are. And then if you apply the PDCA, the, PDCA, the plan, do, check, act model, simpler thing. If you know where your gaps are, you plan for it, you act, you, you close it, you plan, you do it, you check that it's working, and then you act to make any changes that are necessary. Very simple. And then the last step is about continuous improvement and sustaining your process. In PSM, we, 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 we talk about creating what is called centers of excellence. So within your organization, if you have five different plants or refineries, say for example, you have rotating equipment specialists from all these five different plants work together as a center of excellence and bring about continuous improvement. Because guess what? In one refinery, you're going to find that the, 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 the life, the sea life on a pump, you, you, you know, our vacuum bottoms might be eight months and another refinery you can find it being 16 months same pump same process but different lifespan why and why are you not doing it i mean having the same the same seals on, on all of your pump to give you 18 months or 16 months life the only way you'll find that out and we found that out in sunco among three or four refineries we had totally different performance on compressors on rotating equipment and on emergency management processes, all those other things, to the point now where because we've gone on this journey of uh, operational excellence and trying to standardize practices and processes, we've started creating these centers of excellence or networks that are generating awesome performance and, and, and savings for the organization. And then, you know, we promote that culture of learning sharing within the organization and learning from things that are happening within the organization, learning from things that are happening within the industry. We need to collaborate with our industry peers as often as we can and then across the industry because there's some good stuff happening outside of the oil and gas industry. Uh, problem with that is that nobody likes to share the dirty laundry in, in, in the open, in the public, so you don't find companies wanting to share that. But uh, some some leaders talk about HSC learning as, or HSC knowledge as not being proprietary. When you can save somebody's life is no longer proprietary. Share this stuff and share it quickly and without shame or shamelessly. Share it as quickly and as far and wide as you can where HSC is concerned. We're not talking about proprietary knowledge but uh, health and safety stuff. I think I went up.